Bang. How exciting. How exciting we're starting. Oh, we're starting very soon. We are currently live. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Happy Science Week. My name's Tom. Uh, this is Significant Figures. This is a kind of fun little show where we'll get some significant figures, oops, these people, to start asking questions and finding out about our mystery scientist who's waiting in backstage for uh, to meet all of us. I'll explain the rules in just a second, but before I do, I want to tell you a short story, which is important to me. So firstly, it's about my seven-year-old daughter. Uh, she was, The other day, she was playing with her little ushies. I'm sure you remember ushies. Uh, and she lines them up in a class and teaches them a lesson. Now, the other day, before she started teaching them, uh, she clapped their hands and she goes, okay, guys, before we start, I just have to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land oh. on which we were on. <laughs> and I thought that was magnificent. <laughs> it's really important to her that her wishes understand that they're learning in a place where learning has happened for tens of thousands of years. So it's important to me as well. So her or she's and me, where I'm, I'm doing my learning on Wongul land and wherever you are is a place where literally for tens of thousands of years, learning has been happening and it's really important. So let's start doing some of that learning. We're going to introduce you to some significant figures who will grill our mystery scientists to find out what they do. And I'm going to introduce you to them now, starting with Chloe. Go for it, Chloe, Hi. introduce yourself. Thanks for putting me first. Um, my name's Chloe Warren and I am a human existing in 2021. Um, I guess I'm mostly a writer and I, I initially trained in science. So I have a PhD in medical genetics and I always say I enjoyed talking about my projects more than I enjoyed doing them. So I made a very easy transition in from science research into science communication. And now I mostly do writing and I also work in arts administration for a not-for-profit called Tantrum Youth Arts. That's me. Thanks, Chloe. Welcome. Over to you, Luke. Amazing. So, hey, everyone. I'm Luke Stella. Um, I'm coming to you today from Redfern or Gadigal Land here in Sydney. And, um, yeah, I'm a PhD student in astrobiology. So that means I'm trying to figure out that way, way back, way before dinosaurs or bugs or anything, how did life all begin? So I'm looking at meteorites and hot springs and trying to put that all together to figure out how life formed on Earth. Um, I also do a lot of uh, science education. I run a little program called Praxical and we do online workshops and try and teach scientists how to be funny by partnering up with them with comedians. So um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and thank you. And Rachel. Well, hi, thanks, Tom. Uh, yes, so I'm Rachel Renner. I am a science communicator by trade. So I did a undergraduate degree in physics and art history, realized I liked writing about science more than actually practicing it. I'm really bad with measurements. So I uh, have gone out into the world to, to try and tell all the great stories that are out there and help other people tell their wonderful stories in science. Uh, I've done a lot of shows and performing. I write science poetry. Uh, I was hoping to do a show on quantum mechanics in Newcastle this weekend, but obviously I'm not. I'm coming to you from Darug country, which is beautiful. Uh, so it's not a terrible place in the world to be locked down in at the moment. Uh, but yes, I also work at CSIRO. I do communications for the ASCAP telescope, which is a square kilometer array precursor telescope, which I'm really enjoying. Uh, it's very enlightening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should probably have said this, so I live in Newcastle slash Owabakal land. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you just did, which is which is great. <laughs> um, and these are our significant figures. So these significant figures, and they are significant, will be grilling our mystery scientists in just a moment. So, but you can also have a go at interacting as well. If you're on the YouTube live stream, you can write a comment. And uh, we'll see that. And we can start uh, putting that up there on the screen just like this. So if you have a question, please go ahead and ask us a question uh, and we can we can pose that to our, our scientists. Uh, if you do get involved, um, we'll be getting, giving you some sort of a poll towards the end. Uh, and if you give us some feedback, you can start winning some free things uh, like this T-shirt. Uh, you can win one of those. <laughs> Um, or a tote bag, 
or a cap, which I have, um, and some stickers. Uh, so you can win all that sort of stuff <laughs> if you give us some feedback at the end. I'm sure that was predictable. You saw that coming, but that's the deal. All right, so let's get into it. Let's start with our first round, which is called 22 over seven. Now I'm gonna start my clock. So we can, can time how long cat? it takes. Pardon me, Chloe, what was that? Can I hear someone's cat? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, it's not mine. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. I'll start the timer yeah. and we will ask our scientists questions. Uh, they can hear us and see us, so they'll give us thumbs up and thumbs down for yeses and nos. I'll start counting questions. Uh, whichever comes first, we'll stop, see how we go. Uh, we'll start with you, Chloe. Your time starts oh, now. Oh, gosh. Oh, ah. Um. <laughs> Do you work in life sciences? No. Uh, no, no, that's a no. Okay. We do not work in life sciences. Luke, go. Okay. Um, do you take measurements outside? Great question. Yes, I take <laughs> measurements outside. Is Does Great. outside mean outside the planet? <laughs> no. Great. No. Chloe, next. Do you like rocks? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, actually, that's a really bad question. <laughs> Do you work with rocks? Do you work with rocks? <laughs> no. It was a no. I'll give you the free do you like rocks question. The answer was no. And do I work with rocks? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, do the things you measure run away from you? Nope. They do not. Nope. Okay. <laughs> do the things you – oh, wait, it's not life sciences, though. Uh, do you measure liquids? Well, we're thinking about that one. No, no, we don't measure liquids. Do you measure Should humans? Just... Do you measure humans? No, we. I do not measure humans. <laughs> Look. Do you measure um, particles in the atmosphere? No. Hmm. Uh, uh, you measure outside, but it's not life sciences. It's not liquids, it's not particles. Um, they don't run away from you. Uh, do you measure? <laughs> uh, oh, do you? Oh, no. Is the, is the element carbon involved? <laughs> yes. Yes, the element carbon is involved. <laughs> a, nice, a nice safe question, Rachel. Good. <laughs> um, have you ever made an appearance on an ABC podcast? Ooh. Have you made an appearance on an ABC podcast? We're thinking. We're still thinking. We don't know. That's a that's a yes and a no. <laughs> well, it's not Dr. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> if he Dr. Carl's patients might run away from him as well, so maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, so carbon. Do you study our changing climate in some capacity? Mm -hmm. Nope, we do not. Nope. Hmm. That's mm -hmm. 10 questions down. We have four minutes left. Oh, no. Uh, uh, do you look at a specific habitat? No, not a specific habitat. Are you an engineer? No, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> Why did it take them so um. long? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, life sciences. Life sciences includes like ecology, would you say? Or is that a question? Yeah, is that, do you study plants or plant study... systems? No. No, because that's no, life okay. science. Yeah. yeah. What's well, not life science that you measure outdoors, guys? <laughs> <laughs> and not a rock. What else could that be? Yeah. It's not a rock. <laughs> yeah. Rocks, do you... living things. Uh, what else is there? Do you measure uh, oils? Oils. No, no oils. 
Are you a computer scientist? Nope, not a computer <laughs> scientist. We have seven <laughs> questions to go. Two minutes, 45 left. Oh, my God. Oh, this is tough. Is your field predominant, predominantly male at the undergraduate level? <laughs> yes. Mm. That doesn't exclude a lot of sciences, but I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. Uh, Luke, over to um, you. Do you study, um, I guess, like global systems? Like, is it big picture um, studies? Big picture. We're thinking. We're thinking about the big picture thing. Come on. Oh, and it's a no and a yes. It's a no and a yes. An, oh. <laughs> we have five questions it, left, two minutes. Okay. Is it in the field of physics? Is it physics? Yes, physics. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't say this was going to be easy. <laughs> Do we are we likely to recognize you when we see you? <laughs> Slash Are we likely to recognize you? I don't know. Considering we're all Yeah, nice. no, that's that's an uh, that's an I don't know. <laughs> Definitely from Newcastle. I'll give you that hint. Newcastle. What? Oh my god, is it Peter Popotamus? Peter Island. No. Ah! No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that one. That's not a question. You've got one minute ten seconds. <laughs> Ooh, uh, um, three questions uh, left. Do you study um, like waves of some capacity, like electromagnetic radiation, sound radiation, waves, like waves in any no. form? No. no. Is it Jessica? It's not Jessica. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just naming people uh, I know. Is it to do with how things move? How things move? No. Mm. One question left. I don't know if we're going to get it. Ask one more question and then we'll have a stab. <laughs> uh, Do they work no? in renewable energy? Oh, I just... Renew renewable energy. Yes! Oh. No! <laughs> that's a yes. Oh, I think that's the perfect time to bring in our guest. <laughs> to end <these. laughs> Mainly. Here we go. We are all going to say hello to Professor Paul oh, Gastor. Yeah. Woo! Oh, hello. Go crazy. Woo! Hello, everyone. Hi. Lovely to see you this evening. <laughs> I didn't answer the question too obtusely. They were a bit tricky. <laughs> More tricky. <laughs> Oh, there you go. We've just uh, that—that that was my timer going off. You may. Oh. Uh, there you go. You. Difficult to do, I'm sure, when you have absolutely no idea <laughs> uh, who that Very is. Yeah. So, Paul, welcome. Well, um, Thank you. <laughs> can I get you to give us a bit of an introduction about what you actually do? Yeah, yeah. So um, I head up the Centre for Organic Electronics here at the University of Newcastle, and we make printed solar cells, and we also make printed sensors, biosensors. And so your question mm -hmm. about do we make measurements outside, we do because we measure the performance of our solar cells outside. Ah. So I'm sorry, a bit of a misleading answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was very good. I think it's great. It That's really good. Cool. Um, yeah. Do you have before, and um, we've got some time before we move on to uh, round two, but do you have any questions about uh, Paul's work? Now is your time. Oh. Are you we'll have more at, time as well. Are you with CSIRO? No, I'm based at the University of Newcastle. So I'm Professor of Physics here at the University uh, at oh. Newcastle. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been here for 26 years. Um, developing these um, printed solar panels. Cool. Mm. It's, it's quite good for how does the Yeah, oh, sorry. Go for it, Luke. Oh, yeah. How does the organic part of it come into play? Carbon. <laughs> so the, um, the materials that we use in the solar cells, they're actually all carbon-based inks. So we work mm -hmm. using semiconducting oh. polymer. Cool. Mm. That's brilliant. So <laughs> we're pretty much on the money. Yeah. Huh. So how thin are these cells that you're printing? Is it, yeah, like paper thins coming out of sort of an inkjet printer? 
Well, they come out of um, a roll-to-roll -roll printer, actually, like a, like you'd make newspapers, and they're really very thin. So the the layers that we make, the layers that we print, are around about a hundred nanometers thick. The whole solar cell that we make and manufacture is about 0.3 of a millimeter thick. When you take in all the substrate and everything on the top of it, so yeah, they're pretty thin and pretty flexible and pretty light. They only weigh about 300 grams a square meter. Why is it? have thin solar panels what's wrong with chunky ones nothing's wrong with them they're they're great those <laughs> solar panels but what we're excited about is being able to make really really low cost solar panels oh. and solar panels that can go on all sorts of places that traditional solar panels can't so for okay. example your traditional solar panel weighs about 15 to 20 kilograms a square meter that's a lot of weight to put on a roof and there are lots and lots of roofs that can't take that weight uh, here's a quick question that we've got. Have you printed them on anything cool or fun? Your solar panels? <laughs> That's a very subjective question. What I think is cool <laughs> or fun, I have noticed over the years, is not necessarily universally viewed as cool or fun. <laughs> that comes with the territory of being a physicist. Uh, but I will say that um, we normally print on PET plastic, but we have done printing on fabrics, which has been quite cool, uh, especially when it didn't work and they all went black that wasn't so great but you know <laughs> it's been quite good so that's about the 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 um the coolest and funnest uh thing we've printed on so far so you could have solar panel fashion like in principle yeah yeah okay that's cool. well that's that's definitely heading into the oh. realms of cool or fun <laughs> <laughs> mm. um okay how about we move on to our second round now and our second round is called jargon game uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to read out some jargon and or acronyms um, from paul's work and i want you three to try and work out what that means um if you know tell us that's fine if you don't know let's have some fun making it up so our first <laughs> one here we go is called sputtering what does that mean sputtering mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to do this, being given the brief that it's a family-friendly show. <laughs> <laughs> funny, but be clean. Um, <laughs> is sputtering the lights going on and off from the solar panel? Yeah. That's it's okay, Chloe. Really? What you've just done is you've, you've just made everyone else do the work, so that's <laughs> your job. Like, everyone else is now there, right? <laughs> Uh, outsourcing. Uh, no. <laughs> mm. Is it good Because, like, the whole reason that people argue against renewable energy is because it's an inconsistent power source, right? Like, you can't store it easily. Batteries. That's why. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so it's sputtering when there's like a big change in demand or production, and you can't deal with it. Is it's like. Is that it? So you, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it's not. All right. Um, so what is what is sputtering, Paul? So sputtering is the process by which we put down one of the the contacts, the electrodes. So it's a vacuum deposition technique. You throw argon ions in a, from a plasma at a target, aluminium, and they get whacked off and deposited on the surface you want them to land on. Okay. So that's sputtering. Yeah. Good though, isn't it? It is. I, it often, gets this, often people quote it and write it down as spluttering, which, you know, is mm. kind of, you know, almost closer, really. As you go on. Yeah. Um, I've just looked at the rest of the words, and I'm sorry, Chloe, you're not going to have a good time with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next word, saliva. Over to you, Chloe. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it some form of lubricant? <laughs> is it a lubricant, Paul? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. But is it used as a lubricant in your field? No. Okay. <laughs> um, any other guesses about saliva and what that means? So it's a it is, is a it liquid. A really Sorry. Yeah, it's a liquid, yeah. Okay. Ah. Is it an acronym for something really long and complicated? Mm. Or is it? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it something that goes between each of the layers in the panel to like connect them together? No. <laughs> You're selling it. <laughs> All right. What it's is like the, what's the saliva? It, it actually is your saliva. No, it actually is your saliva. We we make we make sensors for detecting things in saliva. In particular, glucose is one of the ones that we're known for for developing. So really low cost sensors um, that detect glucose in saliva for diabetics. Is that what what do you do? Do you like shine? What is the name of the technology? You know, like in mass spec, when they shine lasers through a thing and then based on what's happening over here, they can figure out what's happening here. Is it like the um, same technology? Uh, there, are lots of, there are lots of techniques that involve sort of that sort of process. Um, so, um, I mean, that could, be, that could be some sort of spectroscopy, but, but it isn't. Yeah. What we actually build oh. are, are little sensors that we print um, that we then use the, the transistors, basically. We can use these inks, these electronic inks, to make transistors. And in those transistors, we can embed enzymes. It's all carbon-based, so we literally just stir it in, build the layers of the transistor, and then we've got a very sensitive sensor for saliva in this case. And, and we've uh, shown that we can actually detect glucose in your saliva, and in fact, we recently have been awarded funding to build the first factory to build these sensors in Newcastle. Solar panels. Solar panels. Is that the moment <laughs> for diabetics? It's the it's the finger prick test. Yeah, you have to get a bit of blood, so this will stop a whole lot That's of people right. scared of needles. Yeah. That's right. If you, if, if you suffer from diabetes at the moment, what you have to do is you have to stab yourself four to ten times a day. Um, and people don't like doing it, so they don't do it, and so they have really, you know, their health outcomes are poor if they're not constantly monitoring. Mm. We worked on this because we thought it'd be fantastic, and there there are half a billion people with diabetes. Wow. Is it a better result as well? Does it give you a better reading? Uh, so yeah, it's it's much more sensitive than standard oh. blood glucose sensors because the glucose in your saliva is at a much lower concentration than it is in your blood, about a hundred times oh. lower. So that's why we had to develop a, a way in which we could embed these um, the detection molecule, the enzyme, right in the heart of a transistor, which is an amplifier. How do you know you're not just testing like sugar that's knocking around their mouth because they just ate some sherbet? That's a, that's a great question. If they do just eat some sherbet, that would be bad. Um, so in fact, we're you know, it's like, oh no, that's an excellent point. Shut the factory down. That's never gonna work. <laughs> so, so you're right. And that's true for a lot of saliva based testing. And, and we're starting to realize that saliva is a fantastic source of biomarkers and things to test in. So yeah, you have to follow a set of protocols around how you rinse your mouth out before you test and, and so on. So those are things that you actually, you're quite right, Chloe, those are things that you have to do. So, so nil sherbet by mouth before nil sherbet by mouth okay. just before you do the test. Intravenous, that's okay, but not in your okay. <laughs> not good for the blood. Let's let's go to another one of our terms, which is donor acceptor. This is a jargon term, donor acceptor. What does that mean? Oh, is this in the in physics? Not because we've gone into the medical route now with the <laughs> saliva thing. Is this? Mm. Are we still? T are we talking physics and electronics here? We are. We absolutely are, Rachel. Yes. So I would say the donor acceptor is something to do with the atoms and the well, the electrons. I think, and how many electrons are around an atom, mm. and then you know, and if an electron, if an atom needs an electron, it's going to be an acceptor, and if it's missing an electron, it's. I mean, if it has an extra one, it'll be the donor. That's pretty close, although here we're not referring to um, the, the atoms themselves. Um, we're referring to the way in which in a solar cell, when we excite um, the electron and hole in that system, the electron's got to go somewhere and it's given up by the donor to the acceptor. So you're quite right. Oh, like the and gallium so two, that dokes... two... I'm sorry? Oh. Oh, I think because I know in solar cells you need like a, a doping agent, whether it's a gallium atom or something like that, and that would be the donor? 
Yeah, so so in in conventional solar cells, you're quite right. You have a a, um, a dopant, which could be, for example, boron. Just to to bring ah. boron into the uh, conversation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or other 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 dopants like arsenic, for example, or phosphorus. <laughs> in our case, in these materials, uh, we we also um, have have doping. Uh, and that's associated with this donor acceptor type concept. But you're quite right. Electrons are generated when light lands on the device. They've got to go somewhere. They go from the donor, the polymer, to the acceptor, which is typically a small molecule. Nice answer. Um, I've just had a couple of questions in the uh, from the YouTube comments, but uh, there's a really good one that I'm going to hang on to uh, because it's got to do with the uh, the glucose concentration. We'll come back to that at the end, just to let you know. There is that question and we'll come back to it. The next term though I want to use is nanoletters. What is nanoletters? Ooh. Tiny small words. words. Tiny words. <laughs> no. Tiny words. The handwriting of ants. <laughs> <laughs> Love letters between fairies. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a way that your grad students can tag their name on your solar panels? <laughs> Those should all be the correct answer. Those are all absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. The real answer is far more boring. It's the name of a journal in the field. It's quite a, quite a well-known uh, journal. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, your answers are much better. I like the fairies. I like the <laughs> writing between fairies. I shall, uh, I shall remember that one. <laughs> There you go. Okay, how about the next one, Exciton? Woo! A transformer which turns from an exciting thing <laughs> into a truck. <laughs> no. No. Transform on? What was it? Exciton. Ex Exciton. I just made some yeah, Sorry, Luke. Someone, yeah. Oh, no, I, I see uh, posters of the Exciton, um, like, Centre for Excellence around university. I have no idea if they have anything to do with solar panels, but is there any link to that, maybe? Yeah. Is this something yeah, to do with synchrotron? Yeah. Is, it, yeah. is it parallel to a synchrotron? <laughs> No, although that's a, that's a good answer. I mean, physicists like ending words in ton, right? <laughs> when they're talking about <laughs> so we're we're very we're very um you know boring we're not very imaginative so you know a particle of light of course is a photon an exciton mm. is an excited state so it's a party and you can treat it as a particle they move these excited states exactly and so in the case of a solar cell what happens is light comes in and it excites an electron from a lower level to a higher level, but it leaves behind the positive charge, uh, which physicists euphemistically call the hole. Um, and in the case of these solar cells, those two are bound because they're a positive and a negative charge. And they orbit each other, and that's called an exciton. And that thing that's orbiting actually moves through the material. So it's a particle of an excited state, an exciton. Do they exist in biology? Is that like with ATP and stuff? No. Uh, not exactly, but in biology, you do get, of course, excitons formed in photosynthetic systems, for example. You can see yeah. um, those sort of excited states. So it's it's any sort of excited state, in this case, a, a photoactivated excited state that, that can move. Um, uh, for example, a, a particle of, of uh, sound vibration in a material is a phonon. Again, all these sort of on words. Okay. <laughs> um, I believe that the uh, the suffix on means thing, right? So mm. proton is positive thing, electron is negative thing, photon is light thing, boson okay. is heavy thing. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's just shorter than is thing. sound thing. Yeah. <laughs> or what's it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> You know. Okay, we're going to go to another one, which has uh, got a very similar sound to that, which is not uh, exciton or exciton, but polaron. What is a polaron? A great Scrabble word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 27 I don't points, know. I L's, L's don't have much value, and there's a lot of vowels in there. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, you definitely want it on a triple word score, I think, to yeah, for sure. Score well, <laughs> I think. It's either mm. something to do with extremes or light. Mm. I feel like we're now. Yeah. Or yeah, based off Tom's logic that a on is a thing, it will be a polarized thing. Yeah. Very good. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well done, sir. Yes, it's a polarized state in these materials. So not only can you excite the electron and hole and separate, but of course, polymers and organic materials, they're quite floppy. They move around. And so if there are charges in the lattice, they get pushed around. And so not only do you create this excited state of electron and hole, they kind of have a wake that goes with them. And that's that's a polaron. When they, when they cause a distortion in the lattice as they're moving. It has a different energy, and you can see it in the spectral signature. Yeah, so, I mean, they can, they, can, they can be loss mechanisms. Forming polarons can certainly form loss mechanisms. You're quite right, Rachel, that, um, that they, can, they can be an issue in the, in the devices. So understanding how charges move and the dynamics of charges moving, how fast they move, the rate at which they're going is really important to making better solar cells. When so, you say um, weight, oh, sorry, sorry, go, Chloe, go. Go, go, go. The weight, it have a weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mean, just like a, as in like, a thing that follows. Is that where the word wake comes from with funerals? A thing that follows. Mm. Oh. Oh. oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm explaining to, to, to students at, uh, at uh, Newcastle, I often, you know, describe it's a bit like a boat, you know, and it's followed by the wake behind it. So that distortion yeah. in the water uh, is what this is. It's a distortion in the, in the lattice. Okay, so the next one we've actually covered before, so we'll skip it. It's doping. Uh, we've already talk, talked about doping. <laughs> Oops, um, and sorry, doping. thank you. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, but this one I'm going to need some help with. I don't know how to pronounce it. So it's spelt S-O-X-H-L-E-T. Can you please pronounce that for me, Paul? And then I we can, can work but it would be funnier means. if the others try and pronounce it first. To me, it's... <laughs> S-O-X-H-L-E-T. It sounds like some Egyptian queen to me. X H O L T. S O X H L E T. Socks. French twang to it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Soxlet. You're quite right. It's Soxlet. Soxlet. There you go. So what is it? Tiny socks. We struggle to pronounce it. Tiny socks. Can't write nano letters without his socks. That should be the yeah. that should absolutely be the definition. <laughs> it's the process by which a lost sock transforms into a coat hanger. <laughs> 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 when a mummy sock and a daddy sock love each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is a Soxlet? Soxlet. It's a, it's an it's a piece of experimental apparatus actually. It's a chemical piece of apparatus. So um hmm. I'm uh, the the research center here does a whole set of things not just physics. There's there are organic chemists, engineers, um and now microbiologists in the in the center. Um, and Soxlet apparatus is one that we use for um, synthesizing the materials we use in the inks. So it's actually a way in which you can you can rinse out impurities from um, the material that you make. So essentially, it's a, it's a crucible, and you you it's a bit like a distillation apparatus. You you pass uh, vapor over the the material, it condenses and then drips through. Um, uh, rinses some of the material and then just clean vapor comes up drops down and so on so it's quite clever it's an old old piece of chemical apparatus but it's got a fantastic name so i thought it was good to <laughs> never, never no no there's no reason why you should all right it. and we'll get to <laughs> one more jargon term uh this is our last one it is bulk heterojunctions bulk heterojunctions what is that? Is heterojunction one word? 
yes, heterojunction is one word, and then there's bulk ones of those. Well, so a like, heterojunction would be a junction between lots of different things, right? Absolutely. Yes. And I, I would be thinking... Really... Sorry, Chloe. And, I was going to say... Bulk is, is... <laughs> in, in any sort of electronics, you have P and N junctions. So... That's right. Which is... Mm, the P and the N being positive and negative or something, something. <laughs> Yeah, you're close. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they they refer to what type of charge carrier goes through them that they, they conduct best. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. A heterojunction is a junction between is two different materials. So obviously hetero meaning different and junction meaning junction. Um, but, uh, in the in in these solar cells, they work they work very differently to conventional silicon based devices. In a silicon cell, as you pointed out, Rachel, you've, you've got a junction between a P and an N type material, and and you form that. And that P and N type material actually has an inbuilt electric field. There's a voltage that's formed when a photon comes in. We excite an electron and a hole. And in a conventional solar cell, they get ripped apart by that field. That's what voltages do. They attract charges. And so the electron goes one way, the hole goes the other way. In these devices, as I mentioned, we actually form an exciton. And so um, light comes in, you excite an electron, you leave behind a positive charge, they orbit, and we know that positive and negative attract. So what they really want to do is recombine. And that's about as much use as a chocolate teapot. You know, <laughs> put in light. That's my dad's favorite saying. Yeah, you put in light. <laughs> He's probably about as old as I am. Uh, you put in light <laughs> and, you know, you get nothing out of it. But as I said, these excitons, they can move in the material. And if they, if they bump into a heterojunction between two materials, they can actually separate. The problem is with these devices, it was quickly worked out, but actually they don't travel very far before they recombine. So you don't have very far or very long to do this. Uh, a few nanometers, and so we had to we have to create structures. These these materials that we make, they're very highly mixed, and then we just let them separate a little bit into different phases, and that forms the bulk heterojunctions in the device that are needed to separate those charges. That was probably about as clear as mud. I'm sorry. I hope that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's wonderful. <laughs> Right. Um, that and that, bring <laughs> yeah. um, that brings <laughs> us to the end of of round two jargon game, um, and and that was that was great. So so let's do let's do some more games. This next one is called Two Truths and a Lie. So I'm going to read three statements, and it's up to you three significant figures to work out which one is true or which two are true, and which one is the lie. You can ask questions. Um, if you like, and Paul will answer. Paul might be a little bit vague with his answers, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, the name of the game here is to trip, trip you up so that we can have a bit of a discussion about which is the actual truth and which is the actual lie. Anyway, so here we go. I'll read them out for you. And when I say me or I, it's Paul, not me. <laughs> okay. My claim to fame is that I am related to Freddie Mercury. That's number one. Number two, I was on the Cambridge University rowing team. I was awarded my blades at the boat club dinner by the boat club captain. The ceremony included drinking ale from an old leather shoe of the first boat club captain from 1828. And the third one, I won the young engineer for Great Britain in 1985 for a butt world detector a friend and I made. A what now? Butt weld. <laughs> All right, so do you want to have a quick discussion? Which one is not true? Uh, Luke, I feel like it's really hard to lie well, about winning an award. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it was what you wanted to do for. Yeah, and what is a butt world? What was that? Sorry, I missed that whole yeah. exciting thing. What did you win the award for? <laughs> Oh yeah, so so uh, we won the award for building a machine. Um, I guess I was sort of year uh, 
well, the equivalent of year 10, 11 ish, uh, sort of sixth form, age, fifth form, sixth form, um, for making a machine that would detect butt welds in strip steel. There's a, there was a local engineering firm and they made bearings and, and to make those bearings you had to stick, it's a continual process, you had to stick um, metal together and, uh, and the weld down the middle you didn't want in the bearing. Okay. Oh, so butt welds the weld down the middle. Mm. So I, I was, Chloe had polluted my mind. Chloe had polluted my mind and I was going to different places with that. But, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so you, you had a tour of this factory as part of school and that's what made you guys think you wanted to invent something for it uh yeah i think i think there was um there was some there was some link between the school and the and the factory i think so was there like a challenge like they were trying to get free labor of the student <laughs> I mean, that's that's what it felt like at the time. You know, we we worked through, you know, our breaks and summer, and um, yeah, built this built this machine. What was the award ceremony like? Uh, well, it um, it took place in Wembley. Actually, the national final was in Wembley, um, and uh, yeah, it was was quite um, there was quite a lot of um, yeah. It, it involved a sort of number of. Um, I mean, the whole competition involved, you know local heats regional heats semi-finals then a national final at the i think it was the wembley arena i think oh, or interesting segue there to your relative freddie yeah. mercury, yeah. Wow. <laughs> freddie mercury. Yeah. i'm curious about the rowing um truth because i always thought the shoey drinking out of a shoe was an australian invention so how often did they drink out of the shoe and was it every year since the 1820s or wherever it was and was uh, the shoe quite old and weathered <laughs> yeah yeah no no it's it's yeah. you know it was it was part of the tradition i mean in fact you know the tradition predates you know federation of australia so um <laughs> you know this this shoe has been around for a while um wow do you like put a cup inside the shoe so you're not actually drinking from the shoe oh no no you're, you're just drinking from the shoe i mean that would that would be you know, wouldn't be much what point in. What college did you go to at Cambridge? Peterhouse. It's the oldest college. That sounds fake. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Paul House, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what, did you have a position when you were rowing? Were you like the cocks in the back shouting out stuff or what was your role in the rowing team? No, I, I always rowed at number seven. So that leads okay. the back side of the boat. Oh, I don't know anything about rowing, so number seven could be totally uh, made up. So. Uh, what is the road leading from Cambridge to Bury St Edmunds? Do you remember? Seeing uh, how you lived Newmarket. in Cambridge and Bury St Edmunds was the next biggest town. Yeah, I think it, it might be Newmarket Road. I think the road goes to Newmarket and Bury St Edmunds, I think, from memory. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I feel like, I feel like um, so I grew up in Bury St Edmunds. <laughs> it's um, a lovely town. It's a lovely town. <laughs> Fantastic cathedral. Yeah. They that's, a nice that's afternoon too. Right? <laughs> and I feel like it's fairly likely that drinking from a shoe is something that crazy like eccentric Cambridge people would do, right? That's not that far flung a thing. Mm. I think the most obvious one that is weird is the Freddie Mercury one, but then he could be doing a double bluff, right? Yes, what rel what relation is Freddie Mercury to you? He's my father's cousin. What, uh, how many cousins did your father have? Oh. Gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> so he shared a grandfather or a grandmother with your a grandfather. Right? Mm. And Freddie Mercury was a, a Zoroastrian. Did your <laughs> uncle practice that as well? So, so it's close. He was a Zoroastrian. Oh, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> totally. <laughs> um, and yeah, was that a common practice in your family? Uh, well, I mean, uh, for my father, yes. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> I feel like he would have done research. Yeah. The normal panel show. He's only on the pronunciation, but that's pretty good. He's done his work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it'll probably be we, something we like in the Young Engineers Award for designing a butt well detector, but in 1986, not 1987 or five. Or <laughs> yeah. It's mm. not quite that pedantic. It's it's, it's <laughs> close to that, but not quite that pedantic. Ah, yeah, it's like the rowing mm. one. Is the rowing one about you being in the rowing team or the shoey? Yeah. <laughs> Do you still row? Well, about, that's still a big part of your life. No, no, I'm too old to row now. Mm. It's a tough sport. What is the difference <laughs> between a number six and a number seven, or a number seven and a number eight? Like, do you have specific roles? Mm, you row on different, different sides of the boat. <laughs> okay, I walked into that. <laughs> one, one, you're rowing right-handed. One, you're rowing left-handed. But is there a, a, a different like um, responsibility you have other than? Rowing yeah. fast? Yeah. So the stroke uh, or number eight is the oarsman who, who leads the stroke. So everyone has to follow him. Um, remember, you're, you're pushing the boat backwards. Yeah. Um, number seven leads that side. So he's got to uh -huh. follow, he or she has got to follow the stroke. And then everyone on that side is following their blade. Um, and uh, if you're rowing on a windy river, then all the way down at the end of the boat, um, the number two and bow are the ones who steer the boat. They have greatest uh, effect on the boat turning it. I feel like this is just a gamble. <laughs> is anyone, is anyone <laughs> leaning in any direction? It may have been designed that way, Chloe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, well let's <laughs> let's lock in. Let's lock in an answer. They don't have to be the same, but um, you know, tell us what you think, and then we can have a discussion about uh, which one's true and which one's not. I'm going for three. That, but you like you won the award, but for something that wasn't about. Wait, no, that wait, is it two truths and a lie? So one is a lie. So yeah, number three is a lie, but okay. you still won That's the award. A Else. That was the young engineer uh, for Great Britain yeah. in 1985 for a butt weld detector. Okay, that's I'm yours. Chloe. Chloe. Yep. <laughs> Rachel's with Chloe. Yeah. What do you reckon, I, Luke? Oh. Yeah, so I think Freddie Mercury's a double bluff and you know a lot about rowing. So I reckon butt welds are fake and that's a total lie. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul, would you like to reveal which is the lie? The lie is that. I was on the Cambridge University rowing team and we drank beer <laughs> from a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> I did row at Cambridge. I rowed for the college. Um, I rowed for Peterhouse and um, we, we took part in the, in the bumps races um, and were awarded our blades. Um, but uh, the other two are true. Uh, I did win the Young Engineer for Great Britain Award in 1985 for a butt weld detector. Of course, that's that's way up on um, on the accolades. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and in fact, my claim to fame is, in fact, that uh, I am related to Freddie Mercury. He is my that's father's so cousin. Cool. Wow, <laughs> incredible! <laughs> so yes, and in fact, uh, my surname Dastor means priest in Zoroastrianism. So yeah. that's oh, why there you go. Very that's cool. why I knew how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll do it. Um, so there oh, was no shoeys at all in Cambridge. Was that was that the lie, or did you there, was no there was no what? There was no shoey. There was no shoe <laughs> drink. No, I don't okay. have any. <laughs> um, but also, the lie was I didn't row for the university. I only rowed for my my okay. college. So. Oh, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when when paul sent me when paul sent me that one he said i oh, you know i i rode for cambridge house but not the university and i did some looking into the cambridge rowing it's fascinating <laughs> like it's huge they take it very very seriously 
Um, mm. So I was, I was down deep into, uh, you know, the bumps as a race. And then, you know, the ceremony where they, where they give you your blades and all that sort of stuff. It was, yeah, That's lots true. of stuff. I don't know if you know about the bumps races, if, if you guys know about the bumps races at all, but you know, mm. it's a, it's a ridiculous race. You basically line up uh, about 20, maybe 24 of the most expensive rowing boats that you can find um, <laughs> along the river. So it's all done on the river cam. Uh, obviously Cambridge is, is, you know, on the river cam um, and they fire a cannon, literally the boats are spaced along the river about one and a half. No. They don't fire a cannon at the boats, but they fire a cannon. And the idea is that every boat is chasing the boat in front of it and trying to bump into it. <laughs> and that's the race. And if you, if you, you, can, you have to touch, you, you can just overlap. And if you bump, then you've got to try and get out of the river, out of the way of the guy who was behind you, who now has to chase two boats ahead. <laughs> This happens yeah, every day for four yeah. days. <laughs> and there are multiple divisions. Yeah. Do they have a rest? They're not like awake for four days rowing. No, 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 no. So you're in a division, you, you have a particular time and then you and then you race. Um but yeah, so there are there are some there are some apocryphal stories about the bumps races. Um but uh you know, I told they, you that drinking out of a shoe wasn't that weird a thing to come out of. No, it's not that weird, actually. No, there's, there's weirder yeah. stuff. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so that's going to lead us very nicely into our last round, which is you can ask that. You can ask that. Um, so please go ahead and ask some questions like this one. What tech is the butt world detector? Is like, Is it magnetic or what technology did you use? Yeah, we did. Yeah, and magnetic is exactly right. So what we ended up doing was we <laughs> we nicked the biggest magnet we could find in the school from the physics lab, um, which was this big horseshoe, you know, big magnet. And um, we embedded a uh, Hall effect sensor in the center of it. And as the as the, and we mounted that on a little trolley on a cart which we built. And as the as it went over the strip steel. When the weld was there, it, it was a bit raised, and so it detected the signal of the weld as it went over it. So, um, and the, the company was was actually um, quite a quite a well known and famous company in the UK. It was um, Vanderville's was the name of the company, um, and they they actually um, secured the license in the 1930s for this new type of bearing, shell bearing that goes in the bottom of piston rings. Um, and it was a continuous casting process. They had to cast the bearing material, which is like a bronze alloy, on the steel. And of course, you don't want to have that that horrible weld, which is where you join. So butt welding is where you join two bits of the the, the roll together in a in a button, big electric arc weld. And you don't want that in the bearing. So the the solution they had was a guy with a glove would stand there feeling for the weld and go, right, there it is. And then they'd cut it out. <laughs> so that was, that was a at, like that being outsmarted by teenagers. Oh, I don't, I mean, we, we, it was, it was, it was a great experience actually to be, to be honest. It was fantastic. So, um, mm. so yeah, it was a, was a, was, we were very surprised to win. Well, has anything and come up? Here's, here's another question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, go for it, Luke. Oh yeah. Was there a patent? Like, are people still using the? Yeah. Um, really so, so I remember there was an awful lot of we got a lot of interest and media and so on. But actually, did anything come of it? No. I, I think it yeah. ended up being. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so okay. here's that question that I promised uh, earlier. How do you measure glucose concentration um, with a transistor? Yeah, so so what happens is a, is a transistor is um, a very sensitive amplifier. So it has three terminals. And usually what happens in a transistor is those three terminals are called the gate, the source, and the drain. And the current between the source and the drain is controlled by the gate voltage. And it's literally a gate. It opens and shuts to let current flow between source and drain. Well, what we do is we actually put the enzyme that detects the glucose in the gate. If you remember, I told you they're all inks. We literally 
pour in the enzyme, stir it in, and then print that gate. Um, so now when glucose comes along, the enzyme binds to the glucose. There's a process that, that actually, when that happens, we create charges in the device, and it changes the current flowing between source and drain really sensitively. It's kind of cool. And it turns yeah. out that you can put almost any biomolecule in that structure. So we can detect a whole bunch of things. Yes, yeah, so there'll be lots of other uses for it in that case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so things like um, testing for biomarkers for cancer, uh, for hormones, for allergens. In fact, we're we're already developing now uh, a sensor for COVID antibodies using the same thing. What's kind of cool? For hmm, kind of cool. We have uh, we have more questions. Do you guys have a question to go to, or I can pick one? I feel like I've made. <laughs> no, no. Here we go. Here's here's another question. What was the prize for winning Young Engineer of Great Britain? Oh, that, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I should say actually. All right. Okay. Well, was there was the boring stuff. There was there was the the plaque and the went to the school and the and the trophy and and all the rest of it. But we got an all expenses paid trip for a week to France, what? Uh, which was great, sponsored by BP. Uh -huh. um, and as a, as a, yeah, and there was, there was a trip to an oil refinery in Marseille and, you know, that sort of thing. But there were a few days in Paris and I remember being taken to a cabaret, um, which I can tell you was terribly exciting for a 17 year old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so BP tried to recruit you into the dark side and here you are like 40 years later renewables yeah, all the way yeah, exactly. I say that to my students you see that uh, you know doing physics is in fact becoming a Jedi and if you end up being an engineer and I teach a lot of engineers you know that's going to the dark side and in fact I remember the chair we had the, the lunch at, that, um, at, the, at, the, at the final involved the lunch with the chairman of Rolls-Royce at the time. And he, I remember him sitting there going, yes, he says, oh, what are you going to study at university then? And I said, my friend, uh, you know, he, he said engineering. Oh, very good, yes, yes, yes. And what about you? And I said, uh, physics. Right, well, he said, oh, you must talk to the I want to engineer an expensive boat and then ram it into another really <laughs> I thought engineering was just applied physics anyway. Yeah, yeah that's I true. Think, I think so. Yes. But that guy probably wasn't quite But they were very I was, I, as I said it was a it was a great competition and um and it was certainly a great experience to you know, it was, there was the judges had to come round and and decide who who would when they would sort of quiz you about the technology you developed and that sort of thing. So it was uh, it was good. It was good practice. Uh, we've probably got time for one more question from you all. Are there any questions that you have before we wrap it up? Hmm. I'm really Hi. Hi. Yeah. We're all being really polite. I feel like oh, that's no, yeah, yeah. Very polite <laughs> people. Um, <laughs> no, please, you. No. Um, <laughs> I'm more curious. Of, <laughs> tell me about the solar panel fashion. I was really curious about that. What's the future of solar panels and clothes and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I think that um, that certainly if you like the, the, the general area around wearables um, is a big part of this sort of technology space, being able to make electronic devices that you can print or fabricate in other ways, but are extraordinarily flexible. And so people are developing all sorts of wearable technology based on these materials. And not only that, but also ways in which we can um, actually have, for example, sensors that could become, uh, if you like, the, the fingertip pressure sensors for a glove or ultimately for some sort of prosthetic. So that's that's all part of this sort of semiconducting polymer space. Um, electronic devices that are just flexible. And, and of course, what's, what's exciting is these materials actually function electronically a lot like us, like our biology. So yeah, was, when you were talking about the gates, I was like, that reminds me of like 
gates in the cell membrane. And I was like, were you inspired by that at all? And how some bacteria can like detect what media and what sugars they're around and they turn on different pathways so that they can um, metabolize that sugar because they know it's what they're sitting in. And it really reminded me of what you're talking about. And I was like, no, no, he's in the physics world. He's not in the biology world, but like, yeah. <laughs> I think these materials, excitingly, are at that interface between yeah. physics and biology. And and one of the key reasons is because if you think about normal electronics, it, it can only transport electrons, right? Silicon and metals, they only transport electrons. These materials transport both electrons, but also ions. So they're, they're based around ionic transport. And of course, that's what you're just describing, Chloe, is the transport of ions in cellular systems. Yeah. Um, and so these materials are far more uh, attuned, if you like, or aligned with the way in which we work in our biology. And so some of the things that we're starting to look at now is how can we integrate these electronic polymers with cells? And so we're now developing ways in which we can, for example, um, using these light sensors as one example, combine them with nerve cells. And so light can be detected and actually that signal passed on to the nerve cell. And you can see applications there, for example, in terms of artificial retinas. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we might wrap it up there. And I'll thank you all extremely much uh, for your interaction. Thank you all to the people on Facebook and YouTube who have commented. That was a uh, great engagement, and I really appreciate it. Um, happy Science Week to you all. Science Week is still going on for the next couple of days, so please, uh, you know, fill your boots. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to uh, all of you significant figures and Paul Dastour. Um, thank you very much and uh, have a lovely evening. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.